The flight itself is like you, you're in between heaven and earth. It was a thrill to be able to see, get in that old Stearman again and to have all of these people give you respect and appreciation. Welcome to Veterans Flight 2015, The Final Mission. My name is Renee Bookout, and I have the pleasure today of interviewing some of our greatest generation, our World War II heroes, many of whom began their naval training or Air Force training in one of the planes that you see behind me, a Stearman. In fact, 61,000 of our naval aviators got their beginning in a Stearman. Today we are going to be taking up some of the World War II veterans who began their service in the cockpit of one of these Stearmans. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride with our World War II veterans. And a great big thanks to many of the sponsors, the organizers, and the volunteers who have put together this wonderful event. You've got your boots back on the ground. How was your flight? You bet you like. Well, every flight is fantastic when you get your boots back on the ground, safely. You know, so any any uh, flight that ends up like this one did is a great one. How's the view from up there? It's very nice today because the sun is out clear. Uh, you can see everything. The beach is beautiful. A lot of people over there all having a good time, I'm sure. Joining me now is Paul McLean. He was a member of our Air Corps. Sir, I understand you will have a big birthday that you're getting ready to celebrate. Well, I was trying to keep that a secret, but it's out, so uh, 99. Well, happy I, birthday to I'm, you. I'm shooting for 100. <laughs> well, this is quite a birthday gift that they've set up for you, sir, going up in a, in a Stearman. How was that experience? It's, I, I wish I could do it all again. Start. 70 years ago where I started and the, the advancement in aviation. Today the kids are flying at 70, 80,000 feet at 500,000 miles an hour by computer. I, I started out when the, the, everything was manual. I participated in the first one and the second one is even better and it's something that your mind cannot ever get used to because every flight is an exhilaration. It's so calming, I can't tell you how relaxing it is for me. I mean, I don't know how other people feel about being in an open cockpit airplane, but for me, it's, a, it's the most awesome experience in the world. You know, I could stay there all day long. It's a wonderful thing, and uh, it, it, it probably has extended my lifespan, just this experience today, because it's uh, good, it just brings you, I feel young again. <laughs> you look at them and you say, we just, we just can't do enough for you. They didn't come back with their hands out, they didn't come back complaining. All they said is, we finished the job, let's get on with our lives. They went back to work, built families, built homes, and literally built the America that we're enjoying today.
joined now by my friend Cass Phillips. Cass, thanks so much for taking some time to talk with us. We Not appreciate at all. it. It's my pleasure. Now, Cass, you enlisted in the Navy at a very young age, am I right? Yes, I was 17, and uh, they made me wait until I was 18 before they would take me. And when they did finally take you, tell me what year that was. That was 1938. 1938. I and had just turned 18, being born in 20. That makes it easy for me to remember my age. Very good. That helps. That was kind right. of your parents. That's right. Thank them. Now, you uh, enlisted and you were a radio man, is that right? Right. Tell us what your role was. My role, uh, if you're talking about once I got into aviation, uh, my role was to be the radio man in a crew, which I was. And, uh, of course, we had contact with the base. And uh, uh, it was just to send messages. We were doing it with uh, Morse code at that time because uh, the voice uh, radios didn't reach far enough for us. We were long-range patrol planes. And your goal was to eventually get to Hawaii. Am I right about that? Oh, yes. I wanted to get into aviation. So when, uh, when the ship that I was on, the USS Argonne, uh, went to Hawaii, uh, I asked to be transferred to Fort Island so that I could get into aviation. That's where it was then. And uh, so I got that, and the, uh, the radio chief over there saw his opportunity to get two more radio men. So I and my friend had to stay there in the radio office for several months while we were aching to get into a squadron. Finally, he says, uh, Phillips, he says, I'm sick to death of seeing you walk around this office uh, pouting because you can't get into a, a squadron. I'm going to send you to one which was just exactly what I wanted, and he did. So I ended up at uh, VP-11 at, at uh, NAS Kaneohe Bay. And what year was that? That was, I guess that must have been uh, 40. I think it was 1940. And where were you December 7th, 1941? I was at NAS Kaneohe. Uh, we had been out the night before and we'd been sleeping a little bit late. So we got up, got dressed, uh, cleaned up and headed for the, uh, the exchange to get breakfast. And on the way over there, we saw a plane fly by, and it looked different uh, from what the, uh, the Army airplanes looked. They had been having maneuvers for a couple of weeks. So I said, you know, they're really making this look realistic. They've repainted their planes, and they painted meatballs on the side of them and on the wings. So we uh, walked on over to the exchange. Not dreaming that there was a war starting. So we went in and the ladies who worked in the exchange were very scared, crying. We said, what's the matter? They said, well, look down toward the hangar and you'll see. So we looked out the front window and there, the hangar had smoke coming up from it, airplanes burning, people running toward the hangar. So obviously that uh, was our place to be. So uh, my friend and I, a fellow by the name of Bruce Smithy, uh, uh, headed for the hangar, running down there with all the rest of the people. And we spent the rest of that morning uh, picking up wounded people, moving planes around to try to get them away from each other, and uh, trying to stay out of the way because we didn't have uh, guns or ammunition. And uh, so uh, we ended up uh, just staying out of the way of the strafing and bombing, or trying to. Uh, the last flight came over, and believe it or not, we ran right into the hangar. Of course, you know that's what they're going to bomb. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they did. Dropped one right in the middle of the of the hangar. And uh, so anyhow, it didn't get us, though. And uh, so we spent the rest of the day expecting an invasion, which, thank goodness, didn't come. But they beat the hell out of us. And the reason they did was because we were not prepared. Mm -hmm. And we're not prepared today. And we're getting worse off and worse off every day. That's my opinion. And that's a message we should take from that. Now, um, you helped move some of those planes yes. out of that hangar, planes that obviously would be necessary over the course of what then became World War II, right? Right. Well, there were two planes. We had just gotten back from the States with a squadron of brand new planes. And uh, so they got all but two of them. And a couple of days later, they called two crews, mine happened to be one of them, and uh, said that we needed to fly those planes over to uh, 
Ford Island because that's where the best maintenance was. Mm -hmm. So we did and we started running our patrols out of there. So maybe uh, three weeks after that, I got orders to flight school and uh, so came to Pensacola and uh, went through flight school here. Now you came to Pensacola here to go through flight school okay. and behind us, I believe this is an instrument that you started out in, am I right? I had already soloed at John Rogers Airport in Honolulu, but I had paid for it myself. Uh -huh. But when I got to uh, Pensacola, that was the plane that they were using to uh, start students out and that's the first one that I soloed in, in the Navy. The Stearman. Right. And it has a nickname, doesn't it? Uh, did they call it the, the... Yellow Peril? The Yellow Peril. I think that's what they did, yes, I believe that's true. Indeed, it was called the Yellow Peril. Right. Now, what did you like about the Stearman? Well, I liked it because it, I was flying it, mainly, and secondly, because it was uh, fairly easy to fly. Uh, it was stable, and you could do uh, all kinds of acrobatics in it, aerobatics, I guess you'd say, and uh, it was strong enough to take it. As a matter of fact, the last time I flew a Stearman was when I was instructing uh, a couple of years later uh, in SNJs, I was instructing instruments, and we had to take the students in one flight in a Stearman and teach them how to recover from inverted spins. And uh, that, in, that inverted spin is when it's trying to throw you out of the cockpit. So uh, I have to admit I had a couple of uh, dreams about doing one and not having my seatbelt fastened, and I'm holding on to try to keep being thrown out of the plane, but luckily it never threw me out. You're getting ready to go back up in a Stearman. I am. Uh, what does that mean to you? That means I had one of the most fun jobs in the world. When a guy gets too old to do his job, and then he gets up at uh, five o'clock or whatever you get up to come out, and fly for an hour doing the same thing that you were being paid for years ago, it's got to be a good job. So it means a lot to me, it makes me uh, feel like, uh, and I'm sure I looked like I was about uh, 30 years old, something like that. Well, you look maybe, like a war hero. Maybe not, maybe. You look like a war hero, which Thank I know that, that, that you are. Thank you. And this is a wonderful program that they've put together for you today. It's magnificent. And the people that have volunteered their time and their planes to come over here and allow us to do this, I can't say enough for them. I can't thank those people enough. Veteran Flight 2015. You're going to fasten your seatbelt, hold you on tight? Alive. Yes, I will. Any bad dreams? No, 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 not at all. I don't have any doubt that I can fly this airplane again. Cass, let's go back to uh, talking about um, your service. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about a happy moment. Right. Where were you when the war ended? Uh, well, strange to say, I came back, I got home on the day, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it was the day that the war ended. I went to bed at my parents' house after spending the day with them. About two o'clock the next morning, I was awakened by someone shaking me in bed, and it was my sister and brother-in-law. They said, what's the matter with you? Get out of bed. Don't you know the war is over? No, well, this is all news to me. They'd been over in San Francisco uh, partying, and, uh, and actually I never got to uh, go to any of those parties. But, uh, but that's okay. I didn't mind. You had a big celebration of your own several years later, thanks in part to the military, and that's when you met a beautiful wave. Oh, Tell us about yes, that. Indeed. That was a great day, great year. Uh, that was in uh, Whiting Field, just north of here, uh, in 1946. And she was working uh, next door to me, and I had to put uh, flight plans through for ferry pilots that were coming through Pensacola and they would put the weather on it and hand it back through. Well, they were planning to have a party, an office party. And they said, well, who shall we invite? So someone said, I don't know if it was my wife or who, said, uh, well, we could invite Mr. Phillips. He looks kind of lonesome. <laughs> so they invited me to a party. We got acquainted and uh, six weeks later, uh, about six weeks later, we were married. Have you taken her up in a plane? Yes, I did. Uh, we, uh, the, the office that I was in at that time, owned a 
a, uh, a Howard was the name of the plane. And uh, so I got her in it one day, and which was legal because she was away. And we were headed for Pensacola. So I took full advantage of it and I said, uh, if you don't kiss me, I'm gonna turn the place upside down. And so what could she do? Right. She had to kiss me. Well, we are going to sign off because I understand you may be going up soon in a Stearman. Do you yes. think it's like riding a bike? Are you going to get back in I there? I absolutely think it is. I, I feel like it is because ten, about 10 years after I retired, I got on a plane out here in a local airport, took it off, brought it back in and landed, and as you say, just like riding a bicycle. I don't think you'll ever forget it. Well, enjoy your flight, take those controls. Thank you for your time, Thank and you. I'm sure that you will enjoy your experience Thank here you with the Veterans much. Flight 2015. I appreciate it, and I appreciate all the people who are responsible for this day. And Cass Phillips, we appreciate your service. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Joining us now is Cash Barber. Cash, thank you so much for your time. A pleasure being here. What does this mean to you today hmm. to be part of the Veteran Flight 2015, the final mission? Well, I can't be any prouder. Uh, here I am, 91 years old, and winding up uh, working with Rory on this or being chosen by Rory to participate is a proud, proud time for me. Well, you are one of America's heroes, part of the greatest generation. If I read your hat correctly, sir, you served from 1941 to 1971. That is correct. I went in the Navy in May 1941, right out of high school. I didn't want to get drafted, so I made my own choice. I went to get in aviation, and it was wide open at that time. And uh, I was selected to go to Aviation Machinist Mate School. 30 of us on graduation in, in uh, uh, the fall of uh, 1941. All 30 of us got orders to Pearl Harbor. They were really building up squadrons over there. They knew things were not going as they should. And, uh, we pulled into Pearl Harbor on the 18th day of December. A terrible sight, a battleship on its side over here, uh, the Arizona and a battleship row in Ford Island. It was a mess with all the planes there. And uh, the 30 of us, uh, they'd opened a new Naval Air Station, Kenny Owen, Naval Air Station, which is on the other side of the island from Pearl Harbor. We had three brand new squadrons over there for us to join. And of course, they got pretty well wiped out on the 7th as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we had no aircraft, we didn't get replacement aircraft till, uh, sometime in February. They put us all in a security force. Uh, there was a lot of rumors, uh, you know, commanders of going to land and they had barbed wire on Waikiki Beach, if you can imagine that. Wow. So they issued all of us a rifle, and we got in a foxhole, and we were security until we started getting aircraft. And I got assigned to a flight crew in, in February. I had my first flight then, a 12-hour flight. Five flights the next month, all about 13 hours. And uh, we got our training going again, and then the squadron got involved in the Guadalcanal campaign. Oh my. So I spent that year down there right after that started. And we got relieved by another squadron uh, uh, end of December, 1942. And the whole squadron got on the president, uh, can't think of the name of the ship now, and went back to the States, all got 30 days leave and told to report to San Diego for reassignment. Well, the squadron reformed in San Diego and I was retained in it. And I met my wife sitting over there uh, in April. We got engaged and was gonna get married in the summer. Mm -hmm. 30th of April, our squadron got orders to the South Pacific. Oh, wow. Uh, so we took off again, and I didn't come back for 20 months. We got involved in everything from the, uh, New Guinea, uh, Philippines, that whole area. Mm -hmm. uh, 
We didn't get relieved till December 1944. Where were you VE day? Uh, let's see, I was home on leave E day. Uh, had just gotten back. Uh, back in December, and of course, that's, that's for 1945. Yeah, we happened to be out at my folks, and uh, my mother came out hollering about 9 or 10 o'clock at night and saying the war was over. And what a blessing that was, because the home front people just done a terrific job backing us up uh, with all the rationing and what have you. I think they had a tougher time. Uh, some of us did, uh, but we operated off of seaplane tenders. Hmm. Uh, we were seaplanes, strictly took off in the water and landed on the water. And then we had a lot of island operations where we lived in tents. Uh, That's tough living. Did you have some hours in a steerman? Never. Never. So this is going to be your first it's logging, a, your first hours in a steerman. Yeah, I've got 7,500 hours a year, but it's all in bigger aircraft. Mm -hmm. You excited about this? I'm really excited. And we had some special times over there. We we landed on a river in New Guinea and evacuated 221 Australian commandos. Uh, the river was 200 feet wide. Uh, our wingspan was 104 feet. And after we landed, we run the nose of the PBY into the muddy river bank and tied up to a tree. And we loaded 25 Australians in our plane. Wow. And they were stacked in there like sardines. Uh, and then we took off upriver, took them into Port Moresby, uh, New Guinea, and got them out of that, uh, that area. They Saved were, a lot of lives. They were being overrun by the Japanese, and they asked to be eva evacuated. So. Saved a lot of lives. That sir. was one of my greatest moves out there. However, we didn't land and pick up three Air Force uh, crew members that got shot down on a bombing raid. Wow. And then after the war, I got involved in the, the Berlin airlift. Uh, the Air Force didn't have enough airframes uh, to do what they wanted to do for that airlift when the Russians closed down the, the transportation coming in. Mm -hmm. So they selected two Navy squadrons to go over there and participate. And I was very fortunate in being involved in, in hauling coal from Frankfurt, Germany, into Berlin. Wow. The Russians tried to freeze those people out or starve mm. them. And uh, it was just the most, greatest humanitarian thing I ever participated in. Went on for nine months. Plane took off every three minutes, around the clock for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, sir, over 30 years, you sure saw a lot, and your service meant a lot to your country, to a lot of people. We are very thankful for that. We're thankful that you've been selected today to join the Veterans Flight 2015. We hope you enjoy your ride. I'm so proud to be part of that. I'm so proud to have served. Well, thank you for your service, sir, and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for taking me. Thank you. We are joined now by Dick Pace, another one of our World War II heroes. Dick, where are you from? Born here in Pensacola. Born in Pensacola. Yeah. And when did you join the Navy? I joined the Navy at spring vacation of my senior year in college because I knew I was going to get drafted the minute graduation came. And they, uh, I took the exams and passed it anyway. When I first got there, they put me on a scale that measured your weight and your height. And the seaman said, hey, Commander, this guy's too short. And he said, well, put the thing across the top of his hair and send him along. <laughs> what year was that? 1941. 1941. Yeah. Where were you December 7th, 1941? I was a brand new aviation cadet at Corpus Christi. And uh, we didn't even have a regular room. We were all up in the upstairs lobby sleeping on double decker cots and Sunday, and we got the news and uh, over the radio. And the next day at the assembly, they said, everything's changed now, boys. We're working with no days off. Wow. Uh, well, behind us are the steermans. Did you have an opportunity to fly? I not only flew them, I instructed in them for about seven months. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, 
if somebody had told me at the time I'd get into one voluntarily, I said you were crazy. Well, you are going to get into one I'm voluntarily. I've been looking forward to it so much I couldn't sleep last night. You couldn't sleep. Yeah. Do you think getting behind the taking the controls again is it going to be like riding a bike for you? Oh, absolutely. About ten years ago, my wife gave me a flight on an SNJ, and I flew it. I was only 85, and I flew it from the front seat. And I could still do loops and slow rolls and everything. Now, how many different airplanes did you fly while you were in the Navy? I think the last time I thought of it, it'd be over 10, I guess. I think I tried to count the number of planes out of the museum that I'd flown, and I believe it was about 10. Which theaters were you in while you were in the, the... Well, I was an instructor most of the time, but we finally went out to Pacific Theater, and we ended up out at Saipan, uh, where we uh, would make strikes on a uh, bypass Japanese island and fly combat air patrols in hopes that the Japanese would send a kamikaze attack down there for the B-29 bombers. And we had a couple of false alarms. I <laughs> to shoot at one. <laughs> and then the war ended very suddenly with the dropping of the atom bomb. And when that happened, a month later, I was on the way home. Wow. How about that? How about that? <laughs> well, in addition to being one of our honored heroes today for the Veteran Flight 2015, and taking an opportunity to go back up and take the controls. I won't get to take the controls. Well, may, we'll just see what they let you do. But I also want to thank you for being a supporter for this program and helping make this happen for other veterans. Well, that was a small thing. I was glad to do it. Well, we're happy to have you do it, and we are honored to have you join us today. The pleasure of all mine. And thank you, sir, for your service. Thank you very much for everything you do. We are joined now by Seymour Cy Marshall. Right. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Now you joined the military in June of 1942, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And what prompted you to do that? We're going to have to go anyway, and I said I wanted to fly, so I joined the, the V-5 program. And where were you stationed first? Where did you do your training? Uh, first training was... Uh, in uh, southern Illinois on civilian primary training at the University of Chicago. And uh, from there we went to Iowa City for physical training. That was, that was really a, <laughs> a tough course, believe it or not. And from there we went to Olathe, Kansas, where we started in the SNJs. And you logged some time in a steerman, is that yes, right? Yes, ma'am, I did. That and the N3N, which was a, a parallel to this one, but built by the Navy Yard. Tell me what it's like to fly a steerman. It's wonderful. You get up there and you're in the clouds and you're by yourself. It's a tremendous feeling. It really is. Open air. Nobody around, just air, right? and pretty clouds. So. Did you do some aerobatics while you were up there? Uh, not, so, <laughs> not so much in primary. I was a little skeptical about that. We waited till we got down to Corpus. Mm -hmm. And Corpus, and then went through everything. The, uh, instruments and uh, uh, bombing and formation, the whole bit, until I graduated in 43. And at one time you served in the state of Washington and just across the river From was the a Hanford plant. Which, Tell us about that. Well, it was a desolate area. The town was small, but uh, with this plant there, it was crowded. And it was a rough, rough city, a very rough city. But uh, we were warned when we took off, don't you dare go over the water there over the river to the other side, they'll shoot you down. I said, oh, man, it must be something important. But we had no idea what it was until we uh, heard about uh, the atomic bomb. And they were actually manufacturing the atomic bomb across the river. At the Hanford plant, right, in Washington there. Now, you were then assigned to Lunga Point, and am I correct that you've had a couple of run-ins with some kamikaze? Fighters? Well, later, later on, the Lunga Point was the Jeep carrier. Okay. And we did 
mainly uh, scouting and protection of the fleet. Uh, it started out that way. And then we ended up with four small carriers. We went through the Sulu Sea in, in the Philippines and up to uh, Lingayen Gulf. And we uh, flew over and protected the troops landing there. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of all that. And then we came back to a resting area. And from there, uh, we went to Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was a tremendously hot box. Everything was going on there. The troops mm -hmm. were landing, there was planes around. And in one of my patrols, I saw the Saratoga. And the Saratoga was steaming backwards. And I thought, oh, there's trouble here. And sure enough, but at that time, it was our own friendly troops who finally identified me mm -hmm. and went off. But I had to stay up in the air for almost five hours and just about ran out of gas because we couldn't get back to the carrier. And it was night and I landed, got out of the plane and got down below into the ready room and boom, I said, oh, oh something happened. Kamikaze hit the bridge. Mm. Gas poured, uh, poured all over the deck and over the side. Uh, but the boys uh, from the fire section cleaned it up pretty good. And we were lucky. We missed two tor torpedoes on that run. Wow. And we shot down three Kates, I think it was. I'm not sure what it was. But it was a busy night, and I lost some friends on the Bismarck Sea that got sunk next to us. They got hit. So we got back on that, and the next thing came Okinawa. And Okinawa was just as bad. And uh, we fought our way through Okinawa. And that was it. It was, it looked like an easy war at first for us, but it wasn't. No, certainly. Well, sir, thank you. I know that you continued to serve. You served okay. in, in the Korean War, and yes, I understand you're a member of the exclusive Caterpillar Club. And then Swiftly. today you're you're getting ready to go up in one of the steermen uh, as Primary part of training. Right, as part of the Veteran Flight 2015. Well, enjoy well, your ride, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Joining me now is Dr. Victor Goler. Dr. Goler, you were a flight surgeon, is that correct? I was. Tell me about the role of a flight surgeon. Well, the role of a flight surgeon is to keep the, keep the flyers happy and healthy. And, and, and when did you join the service, sir? I was in a SAC outfit, Strategic Air Command, 1955 to 1957. And did you have contact with any of the pilots who actually flew these stearmen? No, I don't know any of these particular guys, although I flew out here for many years in the 80s, but uh, I'm a few years younger than them and I don't really know any of them. Now, have you ever flown in a Stearman before? I have not, so I'm excited about that. This will be your first time up. Have it you, will. Have you flown before in a small plane like this when you were in the service? As a flight surgeon, I assume my husband was a flight surgeon. and. He had some flight hours logged in planes and in helicopters. Did you have that same opportunity? Yes, I did. But I, I had three small planes of my own. So uh, one was an amphibian, uh, and then I had a single engine Bonanza and a twin engine Bonanza. Are you still flying, sir? Too old and too poor. But will it be like getting on a bike, do you think? I don't know. It'll be fun, and I'm looking forward to it. You going to take the stick? Feel it now, Will. Well, enjoy your flight, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you for your service. Thank you. We are joined now by Army Corps Air Pilot John Beer. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Well, sir, you joined the military in 1940, is that Nin correct? 1940, that's right. What prompted you to do that? I was hungry. <laughs> and you enlisted, is that correct? I, I was enlisted, yes. Tell $21 us, a month. Tell us about your beginning years of service. Well, I enlisted in July 1940 as a private, making all of $21 a month. And uh, 
I was a, then ended up as a crew chief on an airplane. I was a crew chief before I went to pilot training, and then I went to pilot training as an enlisted pilot. And, Which uh, is pretty rare, right? They only had uh, nine nine uh, months of, of uh, enlisted pilots from uh, from that. I'm trying to think of when it was. But it was March 1942 until November 1942. And at that time, we graduated in my in my uh, class. That whole bunch there was 2,576 sergeant pilots come out. And then in December of 1942, they upgraded us all to flight officer, which was not a commissioned officer, but it was an upgrade. So that was the end of the uh, sergeant pilots. But the enlisted pilots, they kept them on until uh, October 1943. So there was almost 5,000 enlisted pilots at that time. And then they come out with a special order and made us all second lieutenants. But before that, I was on my second consecutive tour overseas, flying uh, close support for the British Eighth Army. And uh, on my second tour, I got a battlefield commission to second lieutenant. Probably the only pilot that ever got a battlefield commission. I stayed on, and uh, five months later, they had promoted me to captain. Wow. And then I went through another tour over to CBI, China, Burma, India. And after my third tour, they sent me home, thought I'd had enough. And you have so, quite a few medals, I understand, is that right? Yeah, I had a, two DFCs, 10 air medals, and a, a various array of other medals. I don't know what they were. So, uh, yeah, I had a lot of medals, yeah. And today you're here to participate. I understand you flew last year as I part. Did, yeah, I flew last year, yes. As part of the Veterans Flight 2014. You're joining us again for Veterans Flight 2015. 2015. Now you've right. logged some time with the stick on a steerman, is that right? Oh yeah, my, I went to prime when I went to primary flying school. That's what I flew was a steerman. As the first airplane I flew, and after that went to basic and then to, went on to to final pilot training in the AT6. But yeah, I flew in a steerman. Now why do they? Why is her nickname the Yellow Peril? I don't know. That's all we call it, was the steerman. And is she pretty easy to fly compared to other planes that you've flown? Because I know you've logged, what, 9,000 hours in the, in the service? Yes. How does she compare to other planes? It's bigger. I mean, inside it's bigger than other planes. Other planes, you're cramped up, and this one, you got that much room. So, so it's uh, like flying first class. First class. <laughs> when you go up seat. in a steerman, you're flying first class. That's right. Well, they've been flying so long, and they, you know, that was 1942 that was, we were flying them. You gonna take the stick today? No, probably not. You gonna let them roll ya? Well, if they want to. You'll well, take I a roll, care. huh? Not for anything. Been upside down before. What's anything. it mean to do this today, to have this final mission again? I, I, it probably means a lot to most pilots out here, most of the old timers, but uh, I don't know. I've been up 9,000 hours in the air, so it doesn't uh, excite me too much. But it I like psychs it. you to put your feet back on the ground, oh, I yeah, bet. I, no, no, I like, <laughs> I like flying. It was nice. The flight we had last uh, last year was flew out over the uh, water and then come back in and landed. Well, sir, thank you so much for your service to our country, the many years that you devoted, and thank you for joining yeah, us today. I stayed in 25 years and retired finally as a Lieutenant Colonel after starting out as a private. Well, congratulations and thank you, sir, for your service. Right, thank you. Joining me now is Clyde Morehouse. Clyde was a member of our U.S. Air Force and you served in the Air Corps, is that correct? That's right. When did you join the Air Force, sir? In 1939. Did you have any idea what lied ahead for you? No, but it was a good job. It was a good job indeed. Gotcha. How long were you in the Air Force? 26 years. And what was your, what role did you play in the Air Force? Uh, I flew airplanes. What type of airplanes did you have the opportunity to fly? You don't have enough time for me to tell you. Have you been up in a steerman? No, it's the first airplane I was ever in. 
What was it like going up that first time taking the stick by yourself? Uh, oh, that was fun. <laughs> it surprised me. I almost, I almost uh, knocked out uh, about a dozen airplanes like that, landing in front of them and almost getting them. Uh, scared me. Do you think that today's flight, which you are doing as part of the Veterans Flight 2015 final mission, how's that going to compare to that first time up there? Oh, I have no idea. Going to be exciting. Oh, yeah. yeah. When was the last time you were in a, st a Stearman, do you think? Right. A well, Stearman, 72 years. It's been 72 years. Yep. Well, I think they've kept the seat warm for you. Do you think you'll take control <laughs> of the stick? Uh, oh, I, it don't make any difference. Uh, I've flown with them. The guys want to fly the airplane. They don't want me in there. I'm too old. And tell me a little bit about your service, sir. What theaters did you serve in? I served in the United States Air Force in, uh, in the contiguous 48 states. Wow. I never got overseas. Okay, so you were you here, were you helping to train some of our pilots as well then? Yes. And what was that like? Uh, it was a job, mm -hmm. which I enjoyed. Right. Uh, I uh, instructed in P-38s, mm -hmm. which is an easy airplane to instruct in. Everybody can fly that airplane, easy. And how about the Stearman? Is that an e easy plane to fly? I can remember. 72 years ago, I don't remember. But that was, it was, uh, I remember it was a lot easier after I flown 10 or 15 hours. Right. And I had no trouble. Well, you're going to have a great time up there today. Uh, what does it mean to you to have this opportunity to go back up? Uh, I think it's more for my wife than for me. Why is that? <laughs> She's, she's excited about something like this. Yes. And in fact, you, she should be watching me right now. Well, hopefully well, she is. When you, whenever you put that on. We TV. will indeed. Make sure she gets a chance to see it. Well, sir, enjoy your flight, and thank you so much for your service. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Joining me now is Paul McLean. He was a member of our Air Corps. Sir, I understand you will have a big birthday that you're getting ready to celebrate. Well, I was trying to keep that a secret, but it's out, so uh, 99. Well, and happy I, birthday to I'm, you. I'm shooting for 100. Well, this is quite a birthday gift that they've set up for you, sir, going up in a, in a Stearman. How was that experience? It's, I, I wish I could do it all again. Start 70 years ago where I started, and the, the advancement in aviation has just uh, left me <laughs> sitting on the ground almost. Today, the kids are flying at 70, 80,000 feet at 500,000 miles an hour by computer. I started out when uh, everything was manual and everything was visual, but then it progressed pretty fast. And I got to fly all the airplanes that the Air Force had. My favorite was the B-29 Superfort. Uh, that was a dream airplane. So big, so powerful, pressurized, and uh, just a, a wonderful machine. Did you log some hours in the Stearman at all? No, we had a different kind in uh, the old Army Air Corps. They had West Coast training and East Coast. Uh, most of the Stearmans went to the Navy, and the Army bought up a whole bunch of airplanes called uh, from, from Orion Aircraft Factory. Little five-cylinder rotating engine, but it was a good trainer, and, and it was a, a tricycle gear. It wasn't a tail dragger like uh, the Stearman is. Uh, Stearman's a little harder to fly than the nose wheel type airplane. But that's, that was a good air, good trainer. And from there I progressed to the hottest fighter that we had, which was the B-40. You know, the, uh, the Tiger uh, uh, thing on the nose. The logo, on the, right. Uh, it was a good airplane until they loaded it down with uh, machine guns and ammunition, and then it become uh, a lead sled. We refer to it as a lead sled. But then we got better airplanes. 
uh, and I got to fly all the fighters in, in that area. P-39, P-40, P-47, P-51, P-63, uh, and so on. But they were all props and high-powered, good airplanes. But then they transferred me to uh, overseas, uh, and then I had the very uh, B-25s, B-17s, B-24s, four engines with long range, they no, no armament, just long range uh, gas tanks so that you could fly all day. Uh, that was good flying, good airplanes, but uh, boring, hour after hour after hour for usually 18 to 20 hour missions. But when I look back over it all, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful profession. Today, the, the youngsters coming along are all into jets, high-speed stuff and computerized. It's no fun at 70,000 feet. It's pressurized, you're comfortable, but you talk about boring. Just the airplane and the computer, and you're sitting there watching your fuel gauges. That's about all you see. Well, today so, you had an opportunity to go up uh, in a Stearman. I don't uh, think you'd describe that as boring, would you? No, that's the fun part. The, this type of flying, that's the reason so many of these retired people uh, opt to a hobby of flying this type of uh, airplane. If you can fly a tail dragger, you can fly a kite, you can fly anything. They're so sensitive uh, and economically, well, not real economically, but it's, a, it's a wonderful hobby. And I, I owe these people so much for the opportunity to uh, experience the fun part of flying. It's a wonderful day. I hope I can repay them some way, somehow. Sir, you have repaid them. You paid it forward with your service to our country, yeah. and we thank you for that. And this is their way, the organizers of this, the sponsors, the volunteers, it's their way of thanking you, sir, for taking taking on what you did in your, 70, your, your many, many years of service, 70 years ago, and for many years. And, and I know that they're proud to have had the opportunity to thank you for that, and privilege, too. I was just on active duty for 25 years, but uh, those wonderful memories. <laughs> it was just great, and I'm so thankful. Well, I'm glad you got to create some more wonderful memories today, sir. Thank you for your service, and thank you for joining us as part of the Veterans Flight 2015. Jeez. Joining me now is Mel Bryant. Mel was a member of our Air Corps. Sir, thank you so much for joining us and talking about the flight that you just took on one of these wonderful Stearmen. How was it, sir? It was very fine. I was very impressed with my pilot, even though he's a Navy pilot. <laughs> it was great. And uh, I hadn't, in my primary flying, I flew a different kind of primary trainer. It was a PT-19 uh, built by Fairchild. This chairman I hadn't flown before. I had two cousins that flew it in flying school a year ahead of me, but uh, anyway, I knew that, that uh, it was a nice airplane, and my, my one cousin on his solo flight got scared to land. And they, he thought for a while they're going to have to shoot him down, but he finally got it on the ground. <laughs> you didn't have any of those problems today when you were up there, no, right? I didn't. No, that was great. That was great. And where did you fly to today? Tell us about the flight. Well, of course, we went out and over, it looked like Navarre Beach and, and around, you know. And I, I could recognize the areas, you know. But it was really nice and smooth over the water and, and saw the lakes and all that, you know bridges and uh, it was really a good orientation flight and uh, but anyway I, I feel so thankful that that uh, Mr. Kinsey got got a hold of me and I guess an acquaintance of mine uh, Judge Pat Maney uh, down in Oklahoma County had recommended my name I, after I retired from the Air Force in 1st September of 75, uh, 
the clerk's circuit court asked me to help him out. So I, I did that and I stayed with them for 30 years. Wow, thank you, sir. So I had 33 in the military, 30 in the clerk's office. And sir, when did you, did you um, join the military? What year was that? I was sworn in on 5 November 1942. 1942. Just a, just a little over 18 years old. I was um, uh, 18 in August. I graduated from high school previously in May. I enrolled in Kansas State College. And shortly after, they announced they were going to draft 18-year-olds. And uh, I just didn't want any part of that. I wanted to do what I felt I wanted to do. And all of a sudden, the recruiting posters had these beautiful airplanes on them. So all of a sudden, I became not a prospective chemical engineer, but a prospective fighter pilot. And I enlisted at Fort Riley, Kansas, and, and I was accepted all the way around and, and was sworn in in November. Well, sir, thank you very much for your many years of service to our military and then your many years of service in the civil service. We appreciate it. I had to. Uh, I, was, I was commander of Herbert Field, base commander of Herbert when I retired. I, I had to come back from Vietnam when we had to, get, had to leave, and that was my assignment. Of course, having about 31 years of service, I knew it was my last one, too, <laughs> and I enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much, and I know that you enjoyed your flight today, and we appreciate you being a part of this program, well, the Veterans Flight 2015, the final mission. I think it is so great, so great. I'm just seeing so many of my comrades out here yes. in the same era, you know. It's, it's really a wonderful thing. And thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. Thank nice you. To nice to meet you. Folks, it's wheels down now. They've just landed. We spoke a couple minutes ago with Mr. Baird before he went up. Mr. John Beard went up just a couple minutes ago. And his pilot I'd like to introduce you to is Bill Ross. Bill, thank you so much for taking him up. You're very welcome. Well, how was your ride, sir? Outstanding. Outstanding. It was a nice ride. Where John? Nice takeoff, nice landing. Beautiful landing. Where did you go? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, maybe you can fill us in on where you all went. Yeah, we took off and went down to the Pensacola Beach uh, where the air show was happening. Uh, made three passes for the crowd, uh, people waving. We saw a lot of beautiful women in bikinis. Yeah, I waved. Down the I, beach. I, I kept waving at him. And uh, he passed me on my landing when it came back. I can say that <laughs> I really got lucky because that's probably one of the best landings I've made. So uh, I give him a thumbs up. He gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> when he landed. <laughs> Bill, what kind of opportunity is this for you to have to share your steerman, to share your time with these veterans, the greatest generation? Well, it is an absolute honor to be here today and be able to do that. Uh, fortunate enough to be the care keeper of, of the steerman for the years that I have it. Uh, hopefully someone will, uh, after I'm gone, will continue the tradition. Uh, you know, the airplane will be 75 years old next year. And uh, it's just an honor to be out here uh, to visit with these gentlemen in this generation, to listen to all of the stories uh, that and, and, and things that they dealt with uh, within the war. It's just a, it's just an absolute honor to be here, and, and I'm very proud to be part of this, and uh, proud, proud to take uh, Mr. Beard for a ride. Yeah. And you enjoyed that ride, indeed. Enjoyed the ride. And how many times have you been up in a steerman? Oh, I went. A lot of times, but I was here last year and I went up in it and also this year. Is it a little different sitting in the front seat versus being in the back seat? I'm not so sure we didn't. We weren't flying in the front seat when I was in primary. The obstructor was probably in the front, you were in the back. and you think so? I you didn't know. have intercom back then, so. No, no, I don't know what we had. <laughs> had that draw sport tube. That's right. <laughs> Talk it was a rubber tube that they would speak <laughs> Talk into. Back and, and, forth. and the student would wear like a stethoscope and, and yeah. they would communicate like that. And do you have former military service no, as well? No, I do not. I do not. What I'm other? a civilian pilot. 
I learned to fly when I was 16 years old. Wow. I've worked as a commercial pilot, a flight instructor, a corporate pilot, and now I work for Continental Motors, which is an aircraft engine manufacturer in Mobile. Mobile, so, uh, I wonder. Aviation is very much part of my life. It certainly turned my life around. And again, it's, uh, it's just a pleasure to be out here today. Well, we really appreciate you taking time from your schedule to help us honor our World War II veterans, the greatest generation. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out. Thank yes, you. And thank you for your service again, sir. I'm glad you enjoyed thank your you flight. Mr. Beard. I enjoyed, enjoyed the flight. Yes, sir. I've got a little gift for you, too, in the airplane. I'm going to go get it for you, okay? I'll be All right back. Mr. Smith, if you would please, would you, will you please talk about what this flight means to you today? Well, it means everything. I just appreciate Roy getting all this together. He does a good job of it, and that's, uh, I think everybody enjoys it. Tell us a little bit about what you did in World War II. Where were you? Well, a lot of places. I spent 29 years in. Wow. <laughs> so, a lot of places. Why? Guam, Midway, Pensacola, Oceana, Norfolk. Wow. Well, we really do appreciate your service. Well, so, you did the beach show last year as well, yeah, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, yes. Sure did. Is there anything you're looking forward to about this year that's different than well, last year? No, it's the same thing, but I, I'd like to get with Roy sometime and go out and fly with him. And, Get control of the play. <laughs> oh, taking taking the helm there, huh? Oh yeah. <laughs> Tell us what it was like when you came back last year and saw the planes for the first time. It, they're pretty amazing that they keep them in such good shape. That's they look they look brand new when you get inside them. Sorry, Roy had trouble with his yesterday. Well, I see he's going up today. Yeah, so. he's up flying up. Right. Are they in essentially the same shape that you saw them in? No. I, I flew them in Dallas, uh, Grand Prairie, and we had about 200 of them out there, and they all tried to take off and land at the same time. It was a, How many hours do you think you've logged in these planes? I brought my log book with me out I think it was 59 or something like that. I don't, I, my daughter's got the logbook. I, I didn't check how many hours. Well, we're hoping that you're going to sit down and talk to us again when you're back well, down on the ground after your flight. Will you do that for us? Yeah, sure. Wonderful. Okay. Here with Leonard Schwartz. How are you today? Just fine, thank you. So, will you talk a little bit about what this flight means to you today? Well, the, the flight and the memories that it brings back is just awesome. Uh, of course, I was in another grant, another division of the Army, uh, although my desire as a child always was to fly. So when the uh, Army Air Corps pilot program was backlogged and they were washing people out, and putting in the infantry, I uh, refused to do that, and I showed them I decided to join the, the Airborne. <laughs> what kind of memories do you have that you'd like to share with people? Well, there are, there are several things that naturally in that particular time frame that are really interesting because uh, it's been so far back. And right now, uh, one of the stories that uh, John Appleyard, I believe, put in his book about World War II was the, uh, the story that I remember our last mission, uh, our very last mission was actually to capture General Yamashita and his group of uh, ragtag followers. And we were off the mainland of Luzon and uh, every night, as we uh, got into our foxholes, the Japanese would fire tracer shots from one mountain to the other. And uh, it didn't bother us because we got used to it, we'd sleep through it. But I was making the rounds of the perimeter one night, and one of the gentlemen from, from Repton, Georgia, I believe, had no reflection on today's Repton, Georgia, but was not too uh, well educated. And he looked up at the moon and he said, uh, 
at that haze around the moon. He says, sir, what's that? And I said, oh, that's an omen. And he said, well, what's an omen? And I said, well, it's like uh, tomorrow the war's going to be over. And he said, uh, oh, okay, thank you. Well, the next morning our replacements came off the barges and we loaded up and went back across the middle of the bay and we heard a lot of shooting and I said, everyone, lock and load, we've run into an ambush. And they said, uh, oh, God, we've had enough of this SIT. And uh, so uh, as we got a little closer, I we looked at the binoculars and I saw that they were shooting up into the air. And uh, we got even a little closer than that and they were hollering, the war's over, the war's over. Of course, we had been in preparation for the landing of, of Japan and, uh, you know, they told us anticipated casualties, 85% dead and wounded. And I saw the landing plan of where we, where we were to land. Well, anyway, I went over to this guy from Repton, Georgia, and I said, what did I tell you last night? And uh, that, that's one of the, the more colorful stories and the more amusing situations that have occurred. The rest of them really were kind of gruesome and things that some of them that you just really don't want to talk about. Uh, going in, uh, actually, when I say 18, I went in the service uh, of the Florida State Guards, which happened to be the unit that was formed right at the war because the National Guard was called out. A lot of people didn't know that. So the replacement for the National Guard was the Florida State Guards. And I lied about my age, I was 15. And by the time I was 18, uh, and not quite 18, they wanted to commission me. And they found out that I had lied and that they had accepted the lie. And so they hushed it up. And of course, following that, I, I went into the regular armed forces. Uh, being that young, it was really, it was really, uh, to begin with, it was an, a, a wonderful adventure to begin with. It wasn't that great afterwards, but now as you look back on it, and thank God those of us that could come back know that uh, they must have been living under a lucky star because so many of our comrades didn't make it back or didn't make it back with all their limbs and now as we see the veterans of today we really look at them with an amount of awesome and respect and can't believe that some of them are not being treated to the very best that they are entitled to. Well I hope you know that this veterans fight that that's being put on here is to honor you, to say thank you to you for everything that you did for this country. And I hope that when you're done flying, you'll come and sit down and talk to us about how it felt to be up there. Would you do that? Oh, I would, because last time I was, went up there with Roy, uh, the flight was so smooth that I felt tempted to get up on the wing and stand on the wing. And of course, uh, Roy was kidding me when he called me the other day and he said, Leonard, we're going to, because you were an airborne, we're going to put a parachute on you and drop you center stage. And I told my uh, surgeon who completed a reverse socket replacement just recently on my left shoulder. And he said, no way, Leonard. <laughs> but, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll find a parachute somewhere. No, no, we're going to keep you in the plane this time. In the plane. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. McLeod, you just came down from your flight. Tell us how it was. Well, it was a great flight. Well, we had beautiful weather, a great pilot, a good airplane, and we took off and just had a great flight over to the beach, up and down, and then back again, and a perfect landing coming in. And how long has it been since you've been up in one of these <clears throat> Well, that was in Well, that was in the early 1940s, so, it's been a few years since that time. Well, you're just telling me a story about your first solo in one of these planes. Will you share that with us? Oh, sure. I, uh, I was in primary in Central Florida, and that's your first time that you get in real flight training. And it was one of the steermans that we flew today. 
and and my first solo, he set me out to go, and I flew around and landed one time and took off a touch and go landing and flew around and came back again, and I landed coming in a little too fast, and I got up on the left wheel and balanced right there, and we we flew all the way on in until I figured it would drop down on the two wheels, but it didn't. It dropped down on the wing tip instead, and we ground looped. But it didn't do too much damage. I'd slowed way down by then, and it it uh, it tore the wing tip up a little bit. But I was more worried about washing out than I was uh, at that time. They were washing out about 50% of the cadets that were going through because of the big excess of uh, uh, cadets that they had at the time. So I was lucky I didn't get washed out and been thankful for Been lucky all my life, especially going through the fine program and ended up with the, the P-51, which was my favorite plane and my choice of all of them. You want to tell us a little bit about flight training? Well, I started out in in Lakeland, Florida, with the Stearmans that we flew in today, and it was it was uh, uh, a little touch and go every once in a while because they had an excess of of cadets in the program, and they didn't need that many, so we had a high washout uh, count going through the entire program. But uh, I was in Lakeland, but I, I, after my ground loop of my first solo, I got through that and I coasted on through the rest of it, graduated into basic flying in, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And then after I finished there, I went to advanced flying, which was in Selma, Alabama at Craig Field. And, and I didn't have any trouble with the AT-6. That was the train of plane for the advance. And I got through that. They put us back a couple of times because they had an excess of cadets going through. So we had to wait. And, and on December the 24th of 44, they moved our graduation to that date and we graduated and I got my wings and bars. And at that time they had about 50% of the class got flight officer bars and the other half got second lieutenant bars. And I was lucky there again when I got a, a second lieutenant's bars and my wings and my brother was there to give me my first salute and I signed a dollar bill for him and gave it to him, which was the custom at that time. And, and at the time of my brother's death, he still had that dollar bill in his wallet, and, he gave, and they gave it back to me. That was, that was quite an experience going through that. But I, I, after you get through, you get your wings and your bars, you, you have to go through combat training, and, and, and I had to wait several, uh, oh, five or six months in pilot pools to get into my combat flying, and luckily enough, here I was again, they assigned me to fly the P-51, the finest plane in existence at the time, and, and I was sent to Fort Myers, Florida, and, and I started flying the P-51s which was an easy plane to fly. It was a single-seater fighter plane, and to do your first solo in that plane, they send, tell you what to do, and they send you out to the flight line and say, go to it. So, so I climbed in that plane, I, I told the, the uh, first mechanic for that plane that I, didn't know whether I'd bring his plane back or not, but I'd do my best. He said, you won't have any trouble. And I took off, did what they told me to in the classroom, and 
flew around and I found that plane was easy to fly and easy to land. So I got, we didn't have any problem ever with that P-51 plane. I got to the, finished all of my training, my fighter pilot training, and, and I got to, to the, to the bus waiting to take us to the flight line and there was a transport plane waiting there to take us over to England for combat. And they, we waited there for a while and they finally called and said the general had canceled the flight and that it wasn't, we, we weren't, weren't going at that time. So evidently they had the war about one and they just wanted to wait until they finished it off before they sit, spent any more money sending us over there. So I was lucky again. Been lucky ever since then. Married a beautiful young lady when I got home and got through college. And we've had a wonderful life ever since. So tell us what today meant to you to be out here and to see all oh. these steermen and, and all these volunteers doing this. Well, it was a highlight of my life going through the cadet program and flying planes when I had no, no idea that I would be able to get through and do that with all of the people washing out at the time. And I, uh, it, was, it was a thrill and, and an exciting time of my life when I was able to get through all of the, what I call, stumbling blocks of the getting through cadets and getting your wings and bars. And it was a thrill for me to get over, get through that. And of course that enabled me to qualify for the GI Bill. So I got out of the service and got my GI Bill to go to college. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Well, appreciate everything you did. Thank you very much. And I appreciate what everybody else is doing here, too. It was a thrill to be able to see, get in that old steerman again and, and to have all of these people give you respect and, and, and appreciation. So I, I'm, I've really enjoyed this. It's been a wonderful time. Good. That was the Mr. Morgan, yes. tell us how your flight was today. Oh, it was the greatest flight I've ever been on, really. And the, the pilot was wonderful, and it was it brought my youth back to me because I flew that Stearman uh, seventy some odd years ago as a aviation cadet, and I graduated from Mariana, Florida, in 1943, just in time to get overseas and spend some time over there. Unfortunately, I was uh, also a POW for almost two years. I went down in October of uh, 43 and was liberated in May of 45, a prisoner of the Japanese in Burma, Rangoon, Burma. So that's part of my experience. The only good thing about being a POW is that you don't have to kill anybody while you're a prisoner of war. So that was my... How old were you then? I was, uh, I enlisted when I was 18. I graduated from flying school when I was 19. I was uh, in White Cross, Georgia when I was 20 and overseas uh, at age 20. And then I got home around age 22. So it's been a and then I, I didn't get married until I was 30. So I had a, there was a span of wild years in between. <laughs> Everybody deserves yeah. those. Yeah. So it's been 70 years since you've yeah, been one of these Yeah, it's over clients. 70 years. What did that feel like when um, you were taken off today? Like old times. It, it was it's just a wonderful, wonderful. Flying is a, is a exhilarating it. You know, when you're into it, and like the, the man that flew my airplane today had a wonderful experience. He was a commercial pilot and did all kinds of very, very good things in Indian airplanes. And he was good today. I watched very closely, and he was good. 
very good. What did it feel like when you walked out the doors onto the onto the tarmac here and, and saw all of these steermen lined up? I couldn't believe it. I, first of all, I thought it was the expense. Of, it must be cost a fortune to, to maintain one of those things. And uh, Bill, my pilot, uh, happens to live in a small town in Georgia, Alabama, Theodore, Alabama, and he has a, a farm with a runway and an hangar for his airplane. He lives pretty nice, but uh, it's exciting. And he says the big thing about him having an airplane is that he has a very understanding wife, which is always, uh, that's primarily the reason for my success in marriage too is my wife not me well these pilots have gotten together to pay tribute to well, you all and I'm just this wondering is a, it's a wonderful thing and uh, it, it, it probably has extended my lifespan just this experience today because it's uh, it just brings you I feel young again so much for watching our Veterans Flight 2015.